I'm Bill Clendaniel. I'm the treasurer of the France, and I'm delighted to welcome this full house of devoted supporters to our work here tonight. This is always a wonderful occasion. See a lot of old friends, meet new people, and realize that we're all a group of people who care deeply about these three remarkable parks. And as treasurer, I can say in a particular way, thank you to all of you for your wonderful support. As we're working on our budget for next year, and uh, the wonderful generosity of all of you is, is deeply appreciated. Sadly, as probably many of you know, we lost our beloved former chair last Thursday. Anne Brooke died with her family around her in Vermont. And we are quite devastated by this. Uh, she's been not in great health for some time, but still, uh, we will miss her dreadfully. I first worked with Anne when we both lived in Concord many years ago. And we helped save an important piece of land in the center of town there. So you can imagine how delighted I was when we both moved different times to Boston that we got a chance to work together again. I was uh, frankly a little astonished when I went to see whether she would consider being our chair because I knew she had some health issues and after all she wasn't a young lady. But she rose to the occasion with no questions asked, with the support of her beloved husband, Peter, and she never stopped. She was infigatable and so successful in so many ways. She was a brilliant fundraiser, and it's because of her hard work and many others, many in this room, that we have uh, the White Memorial Project well underway. And of course, uh, as you probably have heard, um, we have a major capital campaign underway to create the Henry and Joan Lee sculpture endowment. And that was Anne's idea, and she pursued it uh, with her usual vigor. So it's a sad time, but like all of us, uh, we would hope that we leave this world better than when we found it, and that certainly can be said of Anne Brooke. Now I'm going to turn you over to our great executive director, Liz Visa, who will tell us a bit about what we've been up to and what you all have made possible this past year. Welcome to you all. As uh, Bill said, we miss Anne terribly, so I think we should all think about her, keep her in our hearts as we commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to doing the work that we've been doing for 46 years and hope to do for many more years. She was an inspiration to all of us. This has become a sought-after annual event, uh, bringing dynamic speakers that stimulate us to think about these parks, their past, their well-being, and their future. And um, no pressure, John, but this one was a bestseller. <laughs> we have a long waiting list, so I think you'll really be inspired and enjoy the evening that you're about to hear. I want to welcome also our Parks Commissioner, Chris Cook. Thank you so much for coming. We have a number of elected officials that hope they could come, but we have a competing uh, meeting for DCR for uh, issues around the Balfour overpass uh, park issues, and so many of our elected officials are down there tonight instead of here. But all of you who can come and, and can be here, we, we love having you here. I want to thank our lead sponsors, the Motor Mart Garage, and supporting sponsors, Kingdom Savings Bank and Four Seasons Hotel. So some of the highlights of this year. We have spent a million dollars directly into the parks, in parks care and, and capital programs. Again, thanks to you, we've been able to do that. We have launched the, the Joan and Henry Lee Sculpture uh, Endowment Fund, uh, $2.5 million we are raising for that because we want to make sure that we do that work to the highest level. We spend about $100,000 every year in sculpture and we want to commit ourselves, continue to commit ourselves to that high level of work. We are nearing completion of the White Memorial Fountain Restoration. If you've seen that mummy wrapping at the corner of Beacon and Arlington, waiting to be free, she will be free this, this uh, late fall. So we'll be finishing the plumbing work and the restoration of the, of the Pebble Basin by uh, the time we are able to turn the fountain on, make sure it works, and turn it off for winterization. <laughs> and then we'll have a celebration next spring when we put plantings in. 
We've completed the 900 feet of border renovation of the Boylston Street border along the garden. Next year will be the bat last planting renovation in that corner by the Channing Memorial, the Boylston and Arlington Street corner. Um, it's been wonderful. Another thing we've done to in accompanying that is started another volunteer initiative called the Border Brigade. Uh, inspired by the Rose Brigade, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary next year. Uh, any of you that want to go and pick weeds and clean up that border every other week with Bobby Moore, our, our board member, come and look at, find her after, after this at the reception. We achieved our goal of advocating that 171 Tremont proposal be reduced to the zoned height limit in, that, in the Midtown Cultural District. Thank you so much for over 200 letters that were written to support that. There's going to be a BRA, now it's BBDA meeting on Thursday to formally uh, present and accept that proposal. We were so excited to see that we were able to bring that down in the Boston Common and Public Garden Protection Zone and not set a precedent for development that would exceed that zoning. So again, thank you so much for your advocacy in that. We have several um, volunteer initiatives. We have um, tours of the public garden. This is our second year. We toured and, and brought 546 people through the garden this year to learn more about that, that space. Thank you so much for the volunteers and for Shirley Smith and Sydney Kenyon who lead that wonderful band of volunteers. We also have volunteers doing a three season user survey of the public garden. We see a couple of volunteers here tonight. Glad to have you here. We're gonna be learning about who's coming to that park, what they're doing, what their issues are, and it will help us not only in planning, but in advocacy to get a deeper sense of our most heavily used, intensively used park in the city. Wonderful, iconic center of the city, but struggles being that. Um, we are doing all of that. That was my list. <laughs> That's all I need to tell you. So thank you so much for making all of that and more possible. And John, I'm going to bring you right back to the beginning. Sorry. <laughs> now I'm going to turn the podium over to Barbara Hofstetter. She is honorary board member and council member. She will be introducing our speaker. Barbara is one of the founding trustees and chair of the Thar Foundation Board. Among other notable associations, Barbara was president of the Garden Museum Board for 10 years guiding that institution through the planning, design, and construction of that one book called Renzo Piano Design Wing. So, Barbara. So, good evening. Um, it really is my great pleasure to introduce John Al Schiller to you this evening. John serves as chairman of HRNA Advisors, a national real estate and economic development consultancy. Before giving you a view of John's impressive background, we wanted you to be aware of HRNA's <coughs> Boston connection. After a highly competitive process last year, HRNA's uh, HRNA Advisors was selected by the City of Boston as the lead consultants for Imagine Boston 2030. This is Boston's first citywide master plan in 50 years. The goal of Imagine Boston 2030 is to define a vision for Boston and create a framework to preserve wisely, enhance equitably, and grow inclusively. There are, few people, excuse me, there are few people better qualified to help Boston undertake this vital planning effort than John. For over 35 years, John has worked with cities, civic organizations, and developers to solve complex urban development challenges and create financing strategies for distinctive places like the High Line, the Anacostia Waterfront, and Daniel Island. His ability to build effective partnerships between the public and private sectors has aided the reinvention of American cities into urban centers that offer jobs and sustain a high quality of life for diverse communities. In 2009, he was elected board chair of Friends of the High Line and now serves as emeritus chair of the organization. We're honored to have John share his wisdom 
Am I changing slides here without <laughs> trying to? <laughs> Sorry. Am I into your slideshow now, John? <laughs> We're honored to have John share his wisdom and vision with us tonight as we confront some critical questions for our parks within a growing and developing city. For example, how can Boston's legacy parks be protected and sustained as the city grows and the pressure on these parks increases? And what role can our parks, together with newly created green spaces, play in support of the city's growth and development? I'm confident that we will come away enriched by John's insights, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Liz, and, and, and thank you, Barbara, for, for such a generous welcome for, for myself and my really beautiful wife, Diana, who's, who's <clears throat> joined me for, 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 for the trip here. It's a, it's a joy to, to be here. Uh, as, as you know, your organization is, is one of America's first, oldest, and, and most distinguished Parks Friends organizations. Uh, I have admired your work uh, for, for a great deal of time. Uh, your city, Boston, uh, is one of the great leaders in American landscape. Uh, not only have you created some of um, America's great and special places, uh, uh, you're the home of America's greatest and foremost landscape architect. Um, and, and if you'll indulge me just a little bit, it, it, my mother uh, <coughs> grew up in, in, in Brookline on 71 Williston Road, um, proud graduate of the Runkle School, which is Value more than Smith, uh, uh, and I remember as a child she would take me to the public garden, and I'd walk around, and and, and you know some of my lifelong love of open space uh, comes uh, from my early experiences walking as a child through 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 your garden that you take such good care of. Um, I, I, I want to start with 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 these two images because they. They, they speak to me very powerfully about why I think we are all here. Um, the most audacious thing about Central Park, uh, one of the most audacious, audacious acts of American urbanism is, is of course, its name. Um, there was nothing central about Central Park when it was built. <laughs> New York City pretty much stopped at 42nd Street. Um, Central Park was a park built in the wilderness. Um, and the faith in American democracy, the faith in the future of the city, the faith in the notion of civilization, that people would take an 800 acre swath of the wilderness and say, and I'll just skip ahead, that <coughs> generations later, this park would become the heart of, of America's greatest, and I'm sure it is, uh, America, <laughs> America's greatest, and I would argue one of, one of the world's greatest cities. Um, but what we admire most, or at least what I admire most, is, is, is not just the, the enormous genius of, of Longstead and Bo, though I have deep, deep love for it, but the act of civic courage and the act of civic imagination. And, and the tradition of parks and tradition of American open space have been in the heart in our faith in our civic culture. Um, and I, what I'm going to talk about tonight, I think, is a defining minute about where we are in that trajectory. And the need for all of us to come together as, as you have for so long, and work on the redefinition of what an open space means and a redefinition of how we manage them. When, when Olmsted imagined this park, um, it is hard for us to imagine how filthy and dense and hard New York City was. The streets were made of mud. Uh, they were transverse by horses who do what horses do. Um, our principal, probably our only source of heat, was coal, which followed the air. Uh, people lived in a density which is unimaginable today. 
So what Olmsted wanted to create, what he did create, was a vision of an American ideal of a pastoral world, a world that people were leaving to come to the great cities of our country and that they missed, or a refuge people who come from Poland and Ireland and, and Germany and, and, and all over Europe. It was a place that they could come, and we needed these parks as a respite. We needed them as a relief from the intensity and force of urbanism. That's now fundamentally changed. And the American city has become much more garden-like. Uh, we have streets that are fundamentally different. Our, our, our densities are lower. Um, our level of civility is, is, is higher. And the, the more park-like character of American urbanism gives us the freedom to rethink the role of a park, the role of the park as it serves us, and the role of the park in a future of the city. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about what we have to do in order to enable that. And you know, this space, obviously, is, is, is a gift. It was uh, the first place in America where citizens chose voluntarily to tax themselves you have chosen voluntarily to tax yourselves to uh, uh, contribute to the upkeep of the garden and the commons and, 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 and the commonwealth. But that was a tradition that began, you know, many centuries ago when this space was envisioned. But this space, and, and like the great spaces of Europe, this is the, the, the majesty of St. James, um, you know, St. James was built as a, as, as a royal park. It was not designed for the public. Uh, it was designed for the pleasure of the king and the queen and the royal family. And, and these, were, these are the royal parks, not just because it has the modern of the royal family. It was their property. And like Central Park, like the garden, um, these parks are activated by the energy of the city. You, you go through these parks, like you go through your, people walk across them, they're coming to and from work, they're walking with their families, they're, they're there to participate in civic life. Um, and I think that's something that we want to build on, but something we need uh, uh, to augment. Now, why? And, and I want to digress a little bit and hopefully not get too technical, but I think Boston is at a great inflection point in its history. And it gives you both a great opportunity and an important obligation. As you see in this slide, Boston experienced a catastrophe. Um, <clears throat> you lost 300,000, 250,000 people. Um, the combination of the industrialization, the cataclysm of race, um, the effects of crime, and your population loss was greater than any other major eastern city. Um, this is a severe decline, and it is virtually unprecedented in any other American city. And what you see is from 1980 to about 2010, you began to grow, and you began to come back. But what's exciting is that trajectory is now <coughs> fundamentally different. Your peers used to be the big industrial cities of the Northeast, our Baltimore's, our Philadelphia's, uh, uh, our Cleveland's, our Washington. You've left them behind. Um, your economy now is comparable only to the really dynamic great centers of American entrepreneurship and job creation. You've left behind Philadelphia. You've left behind Baltimore. You've joined a very elite crowd in American history. Seattle, San Francisco, New York, and Boston. Um, your rate of growth uh, is now extraordinary. And it's driven by things, and I don't view this for the slightest minute as a passive phenomenon. Um, you know, we now have an economy in our nation built off intellectual capital. And you are a city of 
virtually unrivaled intellectual capital. Your universities, your hospitals, your biomedical communities are literally unrivaled, not just in our country, but in the world. And what Boston has figured out, as Seattle, San Francisco, New York has figured out, how to translate these extraordinary institutions of learning into extraordinary sources of economic energy. So what that means is your population is going to grow. I, I have absolute confidence that in the next 30 years, Boston will have more residents than it's ever had in its entire history. Um, no one would have believed when New York City went bankrupt in 1974 that by 2005 we would exceed our maximum population and we're on the way to 9 million. Uh, we would exceed our historic job growth. And so our struggle in New York is not the struggle that defined our consciousness for two generations of urbanism but the struggle that defines our consciousness now, which is how do we manage growth? How do we capture it? How do we drive it? That's Boston's challenge. And I believe that's the challenge of public open space in Boston. You need 100,000 new housing units in order to accommodate that growth. Um, the job growth is likely to be equally impressive. 200,000 new jobs by 2050, requiring close to 40 million square feet of new uh, office space. And you're, this chart is virtually impenetrable by human beings. But basically, fat means how many people you are, tall means how dense you are. So if you're, North, if you're New York, you're fat and you're tall, right? Because we're very dense and we're very big. Uh, but if you find Boston, which is, which is that, 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 that dark thing right there, um, you see you're very dense already. You're denser than virtually any other American city, say San Francisco and, 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 and New York City. Um, much denser than Philadelphia, Washington, Seattle, Baltimore, etc. So, so you're dense already. You're going to get a lot of dense. <laughs> And, and those people have to go somewhere. Now, this map again is equally impenetrable, but, but the, the simple thing to look at, where it's dark, it's dense now. Now, the darkest places on this map, your densest places, are the places, of course, in your downtown core. The places around the public garden. They're the places around the commons. And given the, I think, very appropriate respect neighborhoods have for height and density, you're going to get a lot denser in the area around uh, your principal open spaces. So how does this all come together? I think it, it comes together as cities rethink why they grow. In, in, in my generation, um, so generations after the Second World War, uh, people grew up believing that they would go to where they could find a job. And you thought about where you wanted to work, and, and, and you pretty much sort of went there. It's all changed now. And, and Boston's great strength, uh, New York's great strength, San Francisco's great strength, is that now jobs follow talent. Companies pick up and go where <coughs> talent is. And this is a massive change. American social and economic history. Um, you know, that, that because talent, educated, sophisticated talent, like the talents produced by your great universities, that's what drives the economy. And so GE is just the perfect paradigm. A company, a great American company, picked up and moved to Boston. They picked up and moved to Boston because of the talent that was here. Now, what does that talent want? That talent wants a culture that has places to live, places to work, places to walk, and they want powerful civic open spaces. They want the kind of parks that are lively, that are active, that function in many ways more like a European piazza. They're, they're not places where you go to get away from city life. 
They're not places that you go for faux rural environment. You go to them because they're great engines of democracy. You see people who are different than you. You walk and you, you look at other human beings. You experience the joy, the great joy, of what it means to be in a city. And that changes, I believe, everything about a park and everything about how you fund a park. Now, Boston is a generous city. Americans are a generous people. For a hundred years, people gave money to hospitals. They gave money to performing arts. They gave money to museums. They gave money to churches. Uh, we have, in the last 30 years, added something new, which is now massive funding for our destination parks. And in New York, in Philadelphia, in Washington, <coughs> in Dallas, our destination parks have been built, created, and adopted by groups that are not just friends groups. They're not there to support. They're there to own, develop, and manage. Now, why is that? One of it is very simple. It's political. As your my good friend, and, and you're very lucky to have such a distinguished parks director, as Chris knows, there's an inevitable political dynamic. It costs more money to maintain a dense open space. They're more heavily used. The, the physical environment requires more maintenance. But voters live somewhere else in very large numbers. And we live in a democracy, and mayors pay attention to where people vote. It's just, it's not a failure of any political leader of Boston. No mayor anywhere in America could spend the money to maintain the destination park in the downtown. It's politically intact. Um, for a while, the high wide organization I love, we had more security than the entire borough of the Bronx <laughs> on just our little 1.7 acres. Now, we served 7 million people, but I can assure you, the million people of the Bronx could care less. <laughs> the notion that that little park running through all those rich people had more park security than the entire borough, this was not politically going to last. So, of course, we had to take over the security. So, what, what it says is that we've now entered a new era in which the parks that are part of this resurgence, part of this anchor of how a community grows, Parks that are getting whole new demands from whole new constituencies, which in Boston over the next 10 or 15 years are only going to multiply and get more intense. You know, the value of these open spaces only will grow and grow exponentially in the next generation. And your government will not be responsible for it. Because, not because they're venal or because they're, they can't. And so, Groups like yours have to take up that mantle. And this is, they've done it uh, in, in Dallas. They've, we did it at the High Line. They've done it in New York. They've done it in Brooklyn. They've done, they've done it all over America. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Well, first, as I said, it, it means for a re-envisioning of what the space is. It's not just about the flowers, which are gorgeous, and bless you for caring for them. It's not just about the statues. It's not just about the lawn. It's about programming that occurs in the park. It's about park energy, which is vital. It's about events that bring, not big, large events, but, but events that bring all of the city, so that every citizen of Boston finds a reason to come and love the garden every year or love the commons. And there are events that come in. It becomes truly the commons. It's a place where everybody comes and comes regularly. Um, and it's a place that tourists continue to love. And so it's a park that meets 21st century needs in what is essentially a 19th and 17th century physical legacy. So now, how does this happen? As I said, it's happened in cities all over America. Now, it's not magic, and, and it's not reinvented each time. 
and I'm going to go through some basic rudimentary characteristics. First is there's a powerful and passionate champion, and it could be either an elected <coughs> official, um, you see the smiling vision of, of Richard Daly, who he willed Millennium Park into creation in Chicago. And he went to the major corporations in the city and said, I am your mayor and this is the check I want you to write. <laughs> um, and they were big checks. Um, and with very little city money, but with the passion and power of being the chief advocate for that park, Richie Daly willed that park into being. The other gentleman is, is Jody Grant. Uh, Jody wanted to do something that everybody thought was completely insane, which is to build a park over a eight-lane freeway in the heart of downtown Dallas. And he was the chairman of, a, of, of one of Texas's great banks. And Jody went and raised $100 million. And he got some from the city. He got some from the business community. But Jody was not going to be stopped. People started out saying he was crazy. Um, but Jody went and he had the force of personality, the vision. So step one, you need a powerful and passionate champion. Um, secondly, you need a bold vision. Um, when, when we began the just clearly wacky and quixotic idea of building a park 36 feet in the air on an abandoned railroad. Um, you know, most people either ignored us or laughed at us. Um, but the first thing we did was put together a vision for this park that was so beautiful and so forceful and so compelling. You may not choose to give, but nobody who cared about New York Nobody who cared about public open space could not see the beauty and the force of it. This was not an increment. It wasn't, let's change this section of grass. This was, let's transform an entire space and do it with a level of vision that everybody could get excited. And then we engaged people in virtually every imaginable um, and this wasn't just let's go and have house parties, which are important. This was one of the things I loved the most. We, 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 we took over a room in Grand Central Station where, you know, 500,000 people come in and out every morning. And we put images, and, and part of our problem, which you don't have, no one had ever been on the high line and nobody could go on because it was sealed off and abandoned. So how do you get you know, a community of 8 million people that care about a place they can't see or go. Well, we brought it to them. And we produced this fantastic, powerful visual imagery. And people just walked by and was like, well, what's that? I never heard of this. What's going on? And they just got excited and captivated by the force and power of the idea. And we played with ideas. We, we, we did something which I thought it was a stupid idea, but I was really wrong. It was a brilliant idea. Robert and Joshua, our great founders, thought of this. They, they put out a call for ideas, and they just said, give us your ideas. And, and this is the one that won. It, 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 it's a 1.7 mile long roller coaster uh, <laughs> that would suggest, it, which was the, the winning entry for the future of the high line. Uh, what came in second, a picture I showed you, was a 1.7 mile long lap pool. <laughs> it, you know, and like I say, it was, it was, it was funny, and we we're never going to build it, but what did it do? It, it captured everybody's imagination about the future. And so all of a sudden people were saying, did you hear about the lap pool, or did you hear about the roller coaster? And, you know, we didn't want to build a lap pool, we didn't build a roller coaster, but we wanted people to talk about the island. And we wanted to capture their imagination. And we did. Um, and then, as, as Chris well knows, we, 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 we forged, as all these places do, a collaboration with the government. And you know, the government is our landlord. They're our partner. They're our regulator. But we are inextricably bound in a partnership. We talk to the Parks Department of the City of New York literally virtually every hour every day about something. 
And while we pay 100% of the maintenance of the High Line, uh, for which we raise uh, 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 you know, $10 million a year, um, you know, nevertheless, we operate a public park. And we are responsible to the, the Chris Cook of New York for running a public open space. And we take that seriously. Um, and then we, in the High Line and everywhere else, we, we took the argument I made to you earlier about the fact that parks today are not a luxury, they're not a nice thing, it's not a pleasant place to be. It's one of the core economic assets of your city. I got to figure out to turn this thing on. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, it's, it's a core economic asset. And if you are a developer, if you are a major corporate leader, if you're a mayor, if you're a city council member, if you're a university president, if you're a citizen, we document this is not just about birds and trees. It's about the economic future of your city. And we documented the value. Now, the value is extraordinary. That probably the most accretive investment the city of New York ever made was to build the High Line. Um, it cost the city of New York uh, about $180 million. To date, the incremental tax revenue, to date, the incremental tax revenue is over a billion dollars. So they have made back five times the cost of building that park. Five times. And it's an increased property values, it's an increased corporate moves, and so. Yeah, I'll tell you a little funny anecdote, and then I'll shut up and run for too long. Yeah, I, I, I was, the highlight was sort of inconceivable for a lot of people, including our mayor. And, and I was having an argument with him about why the high line was important. And if you, if you, if you knew Michael Bloomberg, if you know Michael Bloomberg, who, by the way, just, he's such a wonderful, what a great gift to you, $50 million for that museum. I mean, what, what a, what a, What a man with a big heart, right? Yeah. When I went to see him, he was not a big heart. <laughs> you know, he didn't get that money to give away by being all big heart. So, so, so you know, and he also, he's a kind of, you have about 15 seconds to get him where he's going, right? So I got about 10 seconds in, and I realized I was going nowhere. So I realized, he didn't really care about it. It wasn't a big deal. To him. So I finally said, I just I said, Mike, it's not complicated. Right? He's a very big golfer. I said, think golf course. This is the golf course, and everything around it's going to be a fairway lot. And you'll sell the fairway lots, and it'll pay for the golf course. He said, I got it, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, and, and, and really, that's what this is, right? This is, you know, here's where we are. Right? We're in a fairway lot abutting the golf course, right? This is the green space that gives the value to everything around it. Um, and every developer and every corporation, every citizen, every homeowner should understand that the value, and it's only going to get greater as we go. And then finally, and I'll, I'll, I'll start in a second, is, is um, as, you know, what Barbara did at the Gardener, with all of you who have, have, have raised money, it starts with a passion for excellence. You do it right, and everything about it is first rate. And if you want to raise significant amounts of money, my experience is you deliver uncompromised, unflinching excellence. And people develop, and so every piece of paper we put out of the highlight, every event, everything, it's we want people to understand we set a standard of excellence in American public open space. So if they're so kind and generous to give us their money that they have worked so hard for, and for which they have so many other choices, we want them to know that what they will get will be superb. Um, so that's given us these extraordinary open spaces, Discovery Green in Houston, Clyde Warren in Dallas, uh, uh, it's amazing where I plants the fountain, uh, which I love the most about Millennium. And, and so I'm going to skip over this because I've talked too long. Um, so basically, it's, it's about ultimately an intersection of three things. 
It's about a vision, which is about the <coughs> overwhelming importance of public open space to the future of the city of Boston. And as important as it's been in this city for three centuries, I believe it is more important in the 21st century. And it's about communicating why these parks are fundamental to your economy, they're fundamental to your universities, they're fundamental to the quality of your life, and it is the quality of your life that drives all of your economic success. And that goes back to this big paradigm shift I described. Secondly, it's about excellence of design. And I believe both of these spaces have enormous as yet unrealized potential. You know, they are beautiful, they are not, they can be so much more than they are today. They are terrific in many ways due to your generosity, but they can be orders of magnitude greater. Um, and thirdly, you know, it has to be paid for. And, and that's doing the hard work of producing the vision, producing the design, producing the financing, uh, because nobody will do it without you. And if you do it, others can join. Um, and others, you know, we live in a world where leadership drives where money goes. And I believe, in the, at least in my experience, if there is the kind of leadership of force and vision and capacity, uh, it can in fact produce a vision and produce a design that can attract the money necessary to both maintain and transform uh, two of the greatest, most beloved open spaces in my life and two of the greatest and most beloved open spaces in our country. So I, I thank you for, for everything you've done so far and I look forward to watching the uh, ever greater things that I know you will do in, in, in the next generation. So thank you very much. So this is, I, I, we have some time, if I haven't worn out my welcome, to, to, to answer a few questions. So if, if, if um, yes, sir. Uh, there's something I'd like you to spend some time on because I think it's very strategically important as we look forward, which is the tendency of people who write big checks to want to call the shots, uh, which ties directly into the issue of privatization of the commons. Um, it's great that we have really strong organizations with some backbone, like yeah. Friends of Public Garden, to stand up against that. But I think it's a pervasive trend that somehow needs to be taken into account when you forge new private par par public partnerships in this area. It's attention. Um, now, how have how how have I seen attention managed constructively? Yes. One is by a vigorous, assertive role for your government. Um, you know, at, at the High Line, we we operate under rules that are established by our city, and for which our parks commissioner is a fierce, so a, a fabulous and wonderful advocate. And, and nobody had done more for the creation of friends groups and, and, and private operating groups than, 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 than First Adrian Benepi and now Mitch Silver in, in our city. But, you know, we operate at the sufferance of the government. And there are certain things that the government won't allow in terms of privatization of the space. Um, very basic, like the Highline, we're not allowed to ever close the Highline. I would love to make money off weddings, and I would love to close, you know, not even for our own dinner, we can't close the High Line. Because it's a public park, and the Parks Commissioner will not allow us to close a public park. <coughs> and then the second thing is the force of the master plan. You produce a master plan that says what you want donors to give to. And that master plan is, becomes inviolable. It's what you as an organization or we, we have, we had a master plan. This is what we are going to build. And now, you want to name a bench, fine. You want to name a $10 million feature, fine. You know, you want to, you know, but, but 
we went to people with a menu and said, it's like, I'm sure you, 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 you build a museum. You go and you say, here's the entryway, and here's the world. And, you know, and so you, you, you take the initiative. And if the vision is powerful enough and it has enough backing, um, in, in you know, the what, $150 million we've raised so far for Friends of the Iowa, I don't think we've lost a nickel from a donor who, who, who chose to go a different route. Now we have some national teeth here and there, sure, but, but, but I don't think we've lost a nickel. Um, <laughs> other questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mm. Would you be willing to share with us some thoughts that you have for vastly improving the mm. <clears throat> garden and the common? Well, you know, first of all, I'm not a landscape architect. I, you know, I, 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 I love them. I care for them. So I'll give you an amateur's, you know, um, um, I, I, I think that um, in the garden, the 19th century tradition is that landscape is the background. And it produces a very beautiful landscape template, but it's 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 pastoral. It's it's in it's in, it's in the background. The landscape, I think, in the garden can be made more assertive and take a more dominant role in what catches people's eyes. <clears throat> Uh, you know, you don't want to change the vernacular of it. It's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a 19th century park. It should always look like that. But, you know, I think if you if you look at some of the very <coughs> subtle changes in how the Olmsted landscape has been interpreted at Central Park, they didn't, as they restored it, simply replicate it. They, it's great, and, 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 and they're quite fun. When they do it, you look at it and you go, huh. That's more beautiful than I thought it was before. Not, oh, that's different. You know, they, they've taken it, they've sort of made the color, I didn't see bad, they've made the color more bolder or the, or the palette denser. And so it's a more assertive palette. Um, and, and I think that would be a powerful change to the garden. Um, you know, the common needs a major rethinking. Uh, it, it's, it's, been allowed, it, it's been allowed to deteriorate. Um, much of its circulation is incoherent. Um, it, it, its pathways are, are, are not gracious. Some of its spaces have been allowed to become gathering places for things that shouldn't happen in public spaces. And they just need, you know, they just need to be shut down and started over. Um, and, you know, just, you know, I mean, when we, when we started the redo of Bryant Park, Brian, you know, Bryant Park was an open-air drug den. It was the biggest heroin market in New York City. We shut it down and we reopened it. And, and, and by the use of the landscape, by how we changed the entryway, but the bad behavior just had no place to go. It, it, bad behavior requires a certain amount of isolation. And if you destroy the, the, the isolation, you, you drive the bad behavior out. So, so the common, I think, just needs a, 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 a very dramatic new reinterpretation, consistent with its historic role, consistent with its current functionings. But it needs a, a, a fundamental rethinking of, of, of its landscape and its operations. My opinion, certainly. So there's another park in Boston, the Harbor Islands Park. What do you see that that role in Boston's future if we grow? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know them as well. I mean, I, I, I went out to Long Island and spent a day walking around there, which I love. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think there, um, it, it. You need more things that, that, that draw people out there. You know, that, 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 you know I, I, I can go for lunch. You know, I, I, I can go for an art exhibit. I can, yeah, you know, something that preserves and uh, is extraordinary natural heritage. 
but probably the people who do the most thing is one of the, this is not about parks, but one of the well maybe it is one of the great parks of Boston is the watershed of your harbor. You know the space between uh, the downtown uh, of East Boston and South Boston, and I think the, the watershed is itself underutilized, and it extends all the way out to the Harbor Islands. And I think among the many tasks, I'm very good at giving Kristen things to do, but, but it, 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 the, among the things that you have to do is you need a plan for the watershed. And part of it has to do about significantly increasing waterborne transit um, so that uh, you know, you'll never be quite like Istanbul or Venice, but, 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 but you want you want people to feel like they could move around the heart of your city on the water, and that it's you know it's reliable, it's cost effective, and you can spend the day moving around the city on the water and doing things on the water. And so I guess probably what I do one thing is I I increase I increase people's access to the water, and then the islands will follow. What do you do about loving park to death? So the High Line is new and it's attracted lots of people, but it's not. So that may be an issue for, for the High Line, but for the common, it's a significant issue. When you talk about, you know, activities there, but there's a limit to the amount. What's the balance between the level yeah. of programming and Maintenance and care of a part of the commons. Well, I think it, oh, oh, look, I, I, I'm just giving you my bias, which is I think the commons is a long way from reaching its limit. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, it's not the purpose of this gathering. The high line is not far away from reaching its limit. <laughs> but but, but that's, that's a subject of a different discussion. Um, you know, when you when you talk about thinking about a redesign of the commons, I think you think about, okay, let's create places that are designed to take intensive use, that are designed to be programmed, and let's put our programming where we want it. And then let's design other spaces that shouldn't handle and can't handle intensive uses. And and when when I you know, I probably work now on building 15, 20 parks in America. And when you do it in this era, you don't start, or I don't believe you should start, by saying to a landscape architect, envision me an open space, draw me something verdant or beautiful. You start out like you would if you were designing a museum building or anything else. You say, what's my program? What do I want to have happen in this space? I'm the owner. I'm the steward. I'm the custodian. And so these are the kinds of events I want. These are the kinds of pastoral experience I want. This is the, you, know, you tell the designer what the program is for the space. And then, you know, we have so many brilliant landscape architects and so many, frankly, who live and practice in your city. Their job then is to take that program and translate it into a space that can handle the use. And part of the commons problem is nobody has thought through a program budget, defined what should happen there, produced a master plan with a landscape architect that's consistent and is designed to handle the demand that you've designed for it. Yes, sir. Makes me that a uh, constraint on public enjoyment of a public park shadows from high buildings. We've had this issue in Copley Square. We're about to really see it next week or in the next couple of weeks. Boston Common, a developer will be announcing plans for uh, for a high rise with a shadow going across the Boston Common and the Public Garden in September. I'm wondering how other cities have reconciled the natural conflict between developers providing space for our new inhabitants and the public's enjoyment of open space. 
Um, you know, I, I we, 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 had, we had those magnificent images, I still remember, of, of uh, the great jacket on NASA is one of the great champions of open space we've ever had in our country, uh, marching into Central Park with an umbrella to symbolize the shadow that uh, the Boston developer, whose name I won't mention, um, uh, whose building would, 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 would destroy much of the shadow characteristic of, of, of Central Park. So, so this is an issue that follows lots of places. And, you know, I'm a, a, I fervently believe in tall buildings. I fervently believe in density. And I believe in places that they shouldn't be. And, you know, I think it's important to do as you have done to uh, protect the, the, the common and protect the public garden from intrusive shadow, because that destroys something that will only become more precious. Now, that's, I think, the easy part, or not easy, but it's the more direct route. One of Boston's problems is you're much better at saying no than saying yes. <laughs> you, know, you, you know where you, you, you tell developers where they shouldn't go high but you don't tell them where they should go high. And so I think part of the way, and you have to accommodate more people. You have to get higher and denser. And so the only way to figure out how to be able to say, no, you can't go here, is to say, yes, you can go there. And so I think the obligation of effective advocates who appropriately and responsibly, and I think you have been both effective and responsible, have to say no and then have to say yes. Because no, no, no is just irresponsible for the future of your city. That's right. Yes, sir. Um, a, a city with similar dynamics in terms of a healthy level of skepticism about new development is, is Charleston, South Carolina where I've spent a lot of time, and you led a remarkable development there in Daniel Island. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in lessons you may have learned through that that can be applied here, especially as we look at developing new areas like the seaport that have traditionally not been. Well, I'll, uh, give, you, I'll, I'll give you two lessons, what I learned there and what I didn't, but it's applicable to your question. Now, what I learned there is, is, is the just, you know, Charleston's un unparalleled brilliant mayor, Joseph P. Riley for like 45, 48 years. Um, Joe, Joe was probably America's most passionate advocate of the beauty of open space in poor neighborhoods. And Joe built a constituency for the beauty of Charleston's downtown parks because Joe built parks of incomparable beauty in poor neighborhoods. And he said, you know, there are many things that divide us divided by race, we can be divided by religion, we can be divided by income. He said, I've never run into a community that didn't love beauty and didn't love a beautiful park. And, and, and Joe, you know, <coughs> built his constituency and championed that. Now that's, that's a different answer to, to your question. One, I think one of the great opportunities Boston has because you have had uh, a great legacy of, of industrial development. Your, your, your region's economy was founded along the water. Um, now, virtually all that economy has disappeared. You have vastly more space in what you, as you all know, called your DPAs, um, and in your protected industrial areas, and it was warranted by the job producing capacity. And so Boston has a, I think, both an extraordinary opportunity and an obligation to create a new generation of signature open spaces. Uh, and and you know, the Bar Foundation has been just an enormously powerful and, and, and <laughs> dedicated advocate for the rethinking of, of the role of access to the public along the water. And I think that's important for all the reasons I've mentioned. I think much of the new housing and new job creating that you're going to create 
needs to be in those spaces along the water. Um, and and you know, while we all may disagree on a lot in this room, I think hopefully one thing we can all agree on is Boston can do it better than you did at the seaboard. You have opportunities to build new places to live and new places to work, but you can treat the public realm with the dignity and force and power and respect that it deserves. And I don't think that's an anti-development statement. I think it will make the office buildings more valuable. I think it will make the residences more valuable. And the seaport, for its own investors, has been uh, less successful than it would be than if the government had regulated those investors more forcefully uh, in their own self-interest. Um, so you have a chance, I think, to take advantage of you know, the hollowing out of your maritime economy, uh, and frankly, I think a requirement, because that's the spaces you have where jobs can go, where new housing can go, without overburdening your neighborhoods or overburdening your existing spaces. Yes, sir. How does the planning, particularly along the waterfronts and particularly on Boston, incorporate global warming and sea rise uh, it may be in 30 years, it's going to be on half that from the underwater anyway. Um, but I mean, as, as, as Boston uh, is, in terms of the percentage of its economic assets, the fourth most vulnerable city to climate change in all of the United States. Um, you know, you, you, you carve this city out of water. You've all seen the maps of the original Shawmut Peninsula. Uh, this is probably water right here, right? It, you know, when, 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 when the pilgrims got here. Certainly, obviously, the garden was. Um, uh, so, so um, you you reclaimed huge amounts of your land from the water, and the water wants it back. <laughs> um, and, and and so I I think you've got a. You've got a, two forks in the road. You can build a series of protective structures, which I think are not helpful. Or you could say, what we need to do is build a new generation of parks and buildings that are designed as walls between the water and the city. Um, you have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to protect yourself, probably billions of dollars to protect yourself. Um, and, and that, 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 there's no debate about that. That has to happen. Now, you could, the way I think you will both help to finance it, and you'll make these, you know, barriers between you and the sea, uh, uh, you know, part of what you can love and enjoy in Boston is by incorporating in parks and open space uh, new forms of, of, of coastal protection. And to be blunt, you're not doing that now. I mean, what, what's, what's happening now is developers are building building by building, and they're taking their building and they're taking it up out of the floodplain, right? So what does it mean? It doesn't mean the water's going to rush back them and inundate the building across the street inland. I mean, it's dumb. Um, and, 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 you know, you've you got you to change the development pattern such that the new development at the seaport is the, the, the worst case in point. The seaport is, is, is just wholly vulnerable to, frankly, pretty minor changes in, in sea level elevation right now. Um, and that edge was built with no thoughtful attention to, to the environmental consequences of what's there. Um, yes, sir, one more question. Why don't we, sir, we'll, we'll take you and then, I, then I'll, 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 I'll conclude. Considering the water theme, uh, a part of our uh, water that is neglected, I think, is the Charles River. And Storrow Drive cuts it off from the Back Bay. And I, I've seen some uh, BU had a plan to bridge over Storrow Drive to allow its uh, students and people to, to get there. Do you, you see any improvements that could be made? Well, I, I, I think one of the, it, it may or may not speak to your question, and, and, and honestly, I haven't spent as, as much time 
thinking about the trials that I did get, I, I probably should. So one of the great opportunities you have is the Beacon Yards. And you know, it's, it's, it's owned by obviously one of your great universities. And it is where BU, Harvard, and the water come together. Now, you know, it's 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 you know bedeviled as many of these places are by a, a, a pretty ugly spaghetti of, 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 of transportation networks. But that's all changeable and, and can be changed. And the good news is much of that portion of the pike is old and requires re rebuilding in any event. So the question is not, you know, are you going to some fire? You have to have some, you got to rebuild it anyway. So I think the great opportunity to take uh, Boston down to the river uh, is the Beacon Yards. And the Beacon Yards can be one of the great waterfront neighborhoods of, 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 of your city. Um, so anyway, let, let me you know, thank Liz. Let me let me thank all of you.